Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. Yes, I brought back Xavier Reyes Ayral. I hope I don't massacre his name too much. When he first reached out to me, oh gosh, less than a year ago, about a year ago, I was excited to read his email as he was asking if I would talk about this book that he's written, Revelations, The Hidden Secrets and Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I was intrigued from the beginning after today is our third show, I believe, maybe fourth, and the man on the screen is now my friend. We have a common mission. We want to win souls for Christ. We will do whatever we can through whatever means we can. We will use our voices in any way possible. So I have asked him before if he would come on and continue to talk about this book because what you may not know is when you have a podcast, people send you books. I've been on radio, radio for 11 years. You get lots of books and you just can't read them all. And I have stacks of them of maybe grabbing the ones with the titles and skimming through them when they're on my show. But this is one book that I said to our esteemed guest here is like, I want to read every word. So I've had him on each time I read a new section of the book so we can talk about it. So after that long introduction, Xavier, my friend. Thank you again for coming on to the Breakfast Bacon Show. I'm so happy to have you here. And I'm delighted to come again for the third time. I hope we won't be the last one. I'm no. sure you won't. No, because but I got I love... about this much more of the book to read. <laughs> I love being in your show. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's being like a home away from home. Oh, thank you. For me too. So let's not waste too much of our viewers' time. Um, there were three things in here that I specifically wanted to get to. So the first one is one that we had spoken about before, but I want to go a little bit deeper because as I got to page 283, it says specifically the complete third secret of Fatima. So if you could tell our viewers what the Pope, I mean, again, I think our viewers know this, the our Blessed Mother gave a message for it to be delivered, this message, Third Secret, in 1960, or when Lucia died, whichever came first, it didn't happen, uh, the consecration and all those things. And then so we did receive a partial message. Can you kind of tell that? And then I have another question after you do that. Absolutely. Now, this is, we're entering into a very, very serious subject which to this day is, um, in a way, crippling the Catholic Church. Uh, this third secret of uh, Fatima, which was uh, revealed supposedly in full in June of the year 2000, in fact, was only half revealed. As you mentioned a few moments ago, very rightfully so, uh, the instructions of the Blessed Virgin Mary were clear and were not subject to interpretations. There were instructions, not from her, but from heaven through her. And the instructions were clear. The full third secret of Fatima was meant for the faithful, for the Catholic Church. And when the Catholic Church was referred to, it was not meant the hierarchy in Rome, but every faithful around the world, publicly known. No. The third secret of Fatima was supposed, as you mentioned, was supposed to be fully and publicly revealed uh, by the time Lucia dos Santos Maria Fatima would pass away or no later than 1960. In 1960, indeed, the third secret was opened and uh, read by His Holiness Pope John XXIII. His reaction was adamant. He became white using a French expression, why like an aspirin, and put back <clears throat> the secret in the envelope, you know, saying, this message is not for our time. Now again, from one Catholic to another, it appears to me it takes a lot of, I won't say the word goal to be diplomatic, but it seems to me that uh, one would have to be awfully sure of oneself and uh, to think that one knows better than heaven. Than mother. I know. Exactly. And so he decided, like his successor, uh, Paul VI, John Paul I could not be really blamed because he only lived after all for 33 days. John Paul II decided before the end of his reign, finally to have part of the uh, third secret revealed. 
But in this instance, um, the message, according to some witnesses, such as His Eminence Cardinal Ottaviani, no, or even uh, Reverend Father Malachi Martin, who is very well known in the United mm-hmm. States, you know, explained that there were two envelopes that Lucia dos Santos wrote. The first envelope described fully the message, the part of the message we are all familiar with, the vision. No, the second one. The second envelope consisted of the explanation that the Blessed Virgin Mary gave, among other things, of this particular vision. Now, in June of 2000, uh, the church declared that was it. If that were the case, I would bring to your attention and to that of your viewers that of all three uh, secrets revealed in Fatima to the children, the third one would be the only one that would not have been accompanied by a comment or explanation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Why? It forces one to question. Now, when those, this particular statement was made by the Vatican in June of 2000, all the large and the biggest newspapers, magazines of Europe said this is very odd, including Le Figaro, uh, Le Monde, those new top magazines and newspapers in France, a country of, of which I am from. No. So it was not just the French, it was all of Europe, and then I believe some Americans as well immediately raised some red flags. So to that effect, uh, on one instance, Cardinal Ottaviani uh, conferred with some German journalists at the time uh, for a magazine called Europa. And uh, in the book, I write it clearly, uh, on one particular conversation that took place with an American um, journalist. Everything is in there. So, as I mentioned, um, Cardinal uh, Ottaviani was underlining <coughs> before this uh, American journalist all the true passages of the in the article of Europa and those particular passages that originally were found in the third secret of Fatima, the original one, the second envelope. And so that is one of the things, uh, the, one of the sources where I originally found uh, the third secret uh, of Fatima in, accordan- in accordance with um, the statement made by Cardinal Ottaviani. No? On the other hand, there is another source, which uh, is a quite extraordinary, very few people know about. And this appears in, uh, also in uh, the chapter of Akita in my book. You see, uh, the apparitions of Akita, which have been formally approved not merely by the local bishop, um, His Excellency Bishop Ito, but likewise by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome, at the time presided uh, by His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger, who, as we all know, will later become Benedict. Benedict. So we're talking the 1970s, right? 1980s, early... Because Akita took place around 73, I believe, right? Yes, the last yeah. message of Akita was on uh, in 1970, on October 13th, on the anniversary of the of last Fatima. of Fatima, exactly. Wow. So this particular message was of the utmost importance. And I don't mind telling you, leave, we'll leave you a chill down the, your column. No? So in this particular instance, um, and there were a lot of controversies, like, and we both know how the devil attacks and makes controversies oh, yeah. on true apparition sites and true messengers. Yeah. In this instance, uh, Akita was no exception. There was a lot of issues, defamations, attacks against Sister Sasagawa, against the alleged apparition sites and miracles that took place there. So Bishop Ito, at last, was finally convinced of the veracity of Sister Sasagawa and of the apparition case in his Archdiocese decided to mount up a complete and full investigation, a dossier of sorts, which he himself overlooked and took with him from Tokyo to Rome to present in person to Cardinal Ratzinger. And he did. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger was perplexed because he knew of all the defamations, all the attacks that took place against the Akita apparition site. So he was on his guard. But then, when uh, Bishop Ito gave him the last public message given on October 13th, 
1973, Cardinal Ratzinger immediately upon finishing reading the message told Bishop Ito, look, uh, Excellency, there will be no further investigation. The matter will be closed. Immediately he was interrupted by Bishop Ito, who did not mm -hmm. understand and said, your eminence, you haven't given me a chance to explain or to give you the report of the tears, human tears that came out of this wooden statue of Our Lady of All Nations in the convent. He was going on and on. Cardinal Hatzinger calmed him down and told him, no, you don't understand, uh, uh, Bishop. The reason why there will be no further investigation is because Rome will declare the apparitions exactly as you did, worthy of believed, because... In effect, the message that was given to Sister Sasagawa on October 13th, 1973, is in fact nothing less than the third secret of Fatima, yet again revealed. Yeah. This was brought forth as a testimony by Bishop Ito in a Marian convention in uh, Switzerland years later. Mm. Yeah, because when I kept, you know, I think the world woke up, all of us at like different points, we were waking up and I was like, I thought nobody knew the third secret. And then we start finding these interpretations because we got the message, but we didn't get the interpretation. And so when I, I had read that in your book, and I was like, that was very telling. Because before that, I thought, uh, Xavier, that it was just the popes that had read the message, and then they put it back in the envelope. But I didn't realize, again, I mean, maybe I should have, but there were some cardinals around him that had read the message as well. Right, right. I'm not speaking incorrectly. Yeah, so to think there were more people than just these couple popes that knew this message. So when that came out, I know you said you don't want to reveal your sources in addition to what Sister Sasagawa, Bishop Ito, and then, of course, um, Pope Benedict. But were there other... Um, of these cardinals who came out and said the same thing, going, yep, I read it, that's true. And are, do they give their names? I don't want, obviously. If... There were others, there were others, uh, but I know one particular priest, uh, which I think I mentioned earlier, uh, very famous in this country of yours, uh, Father Martin Malakai, mm -hmm. Jesuit, remarkably enough, uh, who went, who was, and again, the full interview, with um, uh, Coast to Coast in 1999 is retranscribed on my, in my book. And there, uh, Father Martin Malakai, who was an advisor of different popes, including of John XXIII at the time, uh, explained the following. He, exp he said, look, I've read The Third Secret of Fatima, and uh, I, I would love to be able to repeat it, although the popes have all these obeyed the instructions from heaven. But I'm, as a humble servant of the church, a man of the cloth, I've made um, an oath that was requested of me before reading uh, the message, the third secret of Fatima. I cannot repeat it per se. However, he added, uh, if indeed somebody were to show me the true third secret of Fatima, I would be forced to say yes. Otherwise, I would be, I would be lying. Exactly. I would be guilty of, uh, of the sin of lies. No. But so if you, and he was addressing the host of coast to coast, if you were to show me indeed a different uh, version of the third secret of Fatima, I will be able to tell you whether this is indeed part or the full third secret of Fatima. So the host of her coast to coast, and it's all in the book, was going through different messages and Father Martin Malakai finally said, yes, this is part of it, this is not. And then at the end of the show, the host of Coast to Coast began to say, well, look, uh, I have a gentleman here in, uh, uh, in Australia uh, who was speaking to an, uh, I think it was another Jesuit in Perth. I believe it was Perth. And he told him that he, that he saw, he read also the third secret of Fatima and that in part of the, in, that at the end of the third secret of Fatima, the real one that is, uh, the Virgin Mary says that at the end, uh, the Pope, the Pontiff in Rome would be controlled by Satan. So what do you think, Father Malachi? Is there, does this sound like something that would come truly out of the third, true third secret of Fatima? And Father Malachi Martin made a long pause. Again, it's all in the book. And he said, well, Art, Art Bell, I think was the name mm -hmm. of the whole. Uh, Art, I have to say, another pause. 
that uh, I am forced to say that indeed the person who stated this part of the third secret of Fatima very likely was either told by somebody who read it or read it himself. Again, that passage was that the, the day will come when the pontiff in Rome will be controlled by Satan. All the details are in the book. And um, I, I'm very surprised I'm one of the ever so few who ever wrote about this. Right. So Because but, I read it completely and then I read it again. And uh, it, I have it marked right in here. So yeah, did so when you first read it, how did you did you feel like what what were your thoughts? I don't even know how to ask you because when I read it, I was like, okay, here it is. I didn't I didn't read it. I heard it. I heard it on one of the archives of Coast to Coast. I heard the original uh, audio interview. And that's what exactly Father Martin Malachi said. I just copied it. And as I was listening, I was stopping, pause, writing okay. letter, word for word, pause, and so on and so forth. That's, that's how I got this information. So the fact of the matter is the message of Fatima, the third secret, and part of this particular message, that there's a part that is mentioned referring to a third world conflict that would take place in the 20th century. Now, immediately, of course, there will be those people that say, oh, well, nothing, there was no world conflict, no third world war in the 20th century. And I put in the book on that, that particular passage because you have to be objective, not just portray and bring to the surface everything that is advantageous to an apparition. Right. Like you have to, to always make yourself, no pun intended, the devil's advocate. So I took a passage of a, and this I learned, by the way, from Father Laurentin himself. So I took a passage of another apparition sign, the one of La Frode, where Marie-Julie Jeanne, the stigmatist, the Britain stigmatist, as she was known, uh, brought forth a message of our Lord, which in the, at the end of the 19th century stated, I don't remember textually the message, but the big lines are these. Why so many of you wonder why some of the prophecies that were brought forth have not taken place when they were supposed to take place? Am I not God the Father who is able to decide whether or not mankind has responded in kind with prayers and proper sacrifices to detain or postpone those prophecies? Right. You know? And that is very apropos, particularly in view of a, a recent a situation I had to deal with uh, and which was resolved thanks to, to you in part and to John Henry Weston. You know? But the message is this. A prophecy, whether it is with Fatima, whether it is something else, is not a revelation that is set or carved on marble or in stone. Every prophecy, like in, and I mentioned it the last time in John Henry Weston's show, uh, every prophecy is divulged or revealed in order for mankind to change the course of events. A perfect example, we're talking about Fatima. The Virgin Mary said in Fatima, if man does not convert in time, there will be a second world war. And Russia, if humanity does not convert in time, will spread her mm -hmm. errors throughout the world. The message was clear. A prophecy was made subject to the response of mankind as to whether or not it was going to take effect. Like in Nineveh, like in Jonas. Nineveh has been decreed that it would be pulverized and destroyed, and it wasn't because humanity responded in kind by converting, by fasting, by sacrificing and changing the, the mediocrity of their lifestyle. That is what, in essence, a prophecy is. It is a revelation sent by heaven for it to be changed. It is a warning. It's like, for instance, if somebody is drinking too much and drives straight towards the wall, the voice, the imploring voice of heaven through Jesus Christ's mother is my children. Change before it's too late. Change be before the catastrophe that is being predicted takes place. That is what took place in Fatima. And perhaps we all know the, what happened in the history of the world. Indeed, and the pious the 11th, which by the way, his uh, reign as a pope finished in 1939, the same year when World War II started with the invasion of Poland by Adolf Hitler on September 1st, 1939. No? 
These particular warnings, and we all know that Russia did indeed spread her as well the world, all this took place exactly as we were forewarned by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Again, I'm forced to wonder, as a Catholic man, whether if indeed the Church would have propagated the third secret the way they propagated the second secret and the first secret of Fatima, as they should have, what would the Second World War have taken place? Yeah. Would Russia have spread her errors? I wonder. And I'm forced, because of the disobedience of the Church, to, to force to ask myself whether indeed these, these events would have taken place. With this particular third secret of Fatima, the same thing happens. With there are other prophecies that such, or such prophet here or there might echo that might not take place, one should not just immediately condemn either the children of Fatima or any other prophet because a prophecy did not take place. One should rejoice and say, mm -hmm. Maybe it is because of the response of humanity through prayer, through fasting, by being good Catholics, by following the teachings of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, particularly the sacraments, confession, and the Holy Eucharist. Properly prepared. Not like what we hear from Rome. Not anyone can just receive the body of Christ as ever they want. You have to be in a state of receive grace. Worthily, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you remind me of a story I heard a while ago. It was like this, uh, I can't remember if it was an atheist talking to a Christian or just, you know, two Christians and said, you know, they're getting on an airplane and they're just praying and praying that the plane wouldn't crash. And then the plane, the plane did not crash. And the one guy said to the other, see, those were wasted prayers. What was the point? And the other one says, how do you know the prayers aren't what kept the plane in the air? You know, you don't know. <laughs> you, you don't know. And so no. God, you know what I've learned through all the people I interview and all the life I live is that God wants faith more than anything. He could lay out all the facts in front of us, which he has many of them. But it's like, I, I feel more love. My husband feels loved by me, I hope. But he feels more loved when I just trust him. He just trusts that I'm going to get you there. I don't have to do it. Can you trust that I'll find a parking spot in the parking lot at Food Line and you don't have to tell me where to park? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, so just, just trust that I love you. Trust that I have your, your, your good at, at my, your best interest at heart. And so in this sense, it's the same thing. It's, I don't have to tell you now everything that I'm doing behind the scenes, behind the veil. But can't you just trust that I am? that I'm receiving every prayer you send, that every time you fast, there is a positive, you know, it's scientific, right? Or is it physics? For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So for every prayer, there is an equal and opposite reaction, but we just may not see it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what I think about when you say this kind of stuff. So, so Xavier, when, when I read that, it was very, very telling, you know, the things that were clarified about you know he the antichrist or you know getting to the top of the chair of peter and you know why would the popes want that that to get out because they're probably looking around going who is it is it you and, and with some of the apparitions that are taking place today or the locutions saying he is about to make his appearance and if he's about to make his appearance this is christine bacon this is not a marian apparition this is me just surmising so no one can report and say Christine was saying ridiculous things. But if he's about to make his his appearance and he is going to gain the the chair of Peter for a time, well, that would make me think that he's one of the cardinals and he's already there. And mm -hmm. if if I were a cardinal or a God fearing cardinal, looking around thinking, are you him? Are you him? Are you him? You know what I mean? So I can see why they would be terrified. But you were right when you said pride. I think it's pride or ego. I'm not going to let this message go. If this isn't the time. Oh, my gosh. When that Pope passed, I hope he was prepared to hear God when God said, you didn't listen to my to my mother. You, you, you took it upon yourself. I would not have wanted to be at that judgment. Quite so. Uh, we spoke, you and I, Christine, uh, before this show, you know, in private, and and we were talking about the same subject, about pride. I will tell you this. Um, 
I, it took me a long time to decide whether I should do any of this. Because for me, as a Frenchman, as a Catholic, the greatest luxury of it all, uh, Christina, I speak to you like if we've known each other for decades, truly, without any false attitudes, and in front of your viewers, whom I think uh, are very good, uh, very good spirit, very good mind. The greatest luxury of all for me is my family, my home where you have stable people, loving pe uh, children who love you back, um, stable um, home life. That's the greatest luxury of all. So mm -hmm. I thought to myself, is it really worth it to enter publicly, uh, writing this book, defending such person or this person? Um, Which propagating... is going to get you attacked. Yes. Is it really worth it to be exposed to the mediocrities of criticism of people who completely forgot the Christian nature of themselves, who, who condemn so easily, no, who criticize so easily, instead of thinking the best of somebody first, they, they have the criticism come so easily before thinking the best. I, it took me a long time to think, and I had to discuss this with my wife. Finally, uh, in view of what has happened, the cowardice of some parties in the Catholic Church by disobedient, disobe disobeying the instructions from heaven, I thought if I, if I can remain silent as well, it's a form of complicity. You know, I come from a country that has been under occupation um, for four years, the greatest humiliation of our history. And like the rest of, country, of the European countries that were under German occupation between 1939 until 1945, there were a lot of collaborators who collaborated for interest with the occupying forces and occupying authority. I come from a family who joined the goal uh, from the first day in the liberation. There were a lot of collaborators in the time that managed to survive and prosper. In the matter with the Virgin May, we're living something similar as uh, the time of our fathers, or our grandfathers, a new war of sorts. And I refused to be a collaborator by being quiet or by betraying my convictions or by doing what the Catholic Church has done, disobeying. Naturally, one must not fall under the temptation to think that one knows better and or one should criticize or condemn. I will not do what the Catholic Church or others have done with true prophets by condemning them, no. I understand. I pray for those who are committing errors. Even today in Rome, I pray for their conversion. I even pray for the detractors of those apparition sites of some prophets here or there today that claim or echo the messages or the revelations they've been granted. I pray. I try to avoid criticism or condemnation because it is a contradiction for a Catholic who calls himself so to criticize or condemn. I prefer kindness. I prefer praying for those whom maybe I think they're wrong. And I expect as well, even men of the cloth who criticize other men of the cloth, I expect everyone who does not agree with me to pray for me. And we have one thing in common. Our prof profound love for God, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, for the church that Christ instituted upon St. Peter, the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. Apostolic meaning from Peter all the way to Francis. Yep. Now, that's what makes us brothers, brothers of arms, even if, even if we don't agree on everything. No? Oh, by the way, I've been accused of being of uh, St. Pius X SSPX. I have sympathies for them. I am not. Uh, I'm glad you uh, clarified that, that yes. So you see, a lot of falsehoods are being spread around. But I pray for those who, uh, and my sympathies are for them. My family was a follower of Monseigneur Lefebvre from day one. So believe me when I say I don't have to take any lessons from the traditionalists. No, I have sympathy with them. But I don't believe that leaving a ship is the best way to change it or to repair Amen. it. Amen. I remain Amen. on board. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what you and I and so many people have in common is we love, of course, we love God and we love Jesus Christ, but we love Holy Mother Church because Jesus instituted it. And so I don't want people to leave the church. I, I was doing an interview with someone before a very uh, relatively famous Catholic um, on the air, and he's like, well, 
So the questions I was asking him were really tough. And he goes, do you want people into the church or out? And I was like, well, in, I didn't want to sound negative, but I wanted to address these tough things that the Catholic church was making mistakes on or, or you know, really hurting the church with, with some of the pe- bad people who have infiltrated the church. And I, I, I'm a natural born optimist, but I also, you know, keep my eyes open to this. So that doesn't sh- throw me away. Like, oh my gosh, bad things are happening. Let me run elsewhere. Because just like Peter, to whom, to whom shall we run? Who, who would we go to? So I even have a friend too. He was becoming Catholic. He was going through the RCIA program. And sadly, we were all like talking to him about these uh, tough subjects, the infiltration of the church, the uh, pederasty scandal, the just all the homosexual crisis in the church. And he pulled himself out of the RCIA program for a time. And he said, I don't know if I want to go into this church. Why are you in the church if they're so messed up? And I'm like, well, Every church is made of broken human beings. Every church has got its mistakes. Yes, right now we're magnifying the Catholic churches because we're in it and we're aware of the mistakes. But I looked at him and I said, but it's the true church. And just like you said, Xavier, you've got to fight the devil from within. You've got to get him out of our church, our home, Christ's bride. And so I do appreciate what you're doing. Go, yeah. We got to keep fighting it, even though there are detractors, even though there are people going to tell you you're writing the book for money or fame or you just don't love the church or you must be SSPX or, you know, whatever, because I think we're all faced with those things. So I just want to say thank you for writing this book, for getting it out there so that we can all at least make our own judgments and have the knowledge that it's like, this is what the book said. These are what some of these apparitions have led to. It doesn't hurt us to be prepared if if we think that the things in the book are, are true, you know? Yes. And speaking and, and, of, go ahead. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, uh, but let's not fool ourselves. There is such a thing as a civil war today in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, and I, one of your confreres, John Henry Weston, right now, uh, it's going through a terrible ordeal. We're not going to go into detail into it, but uh, with your permission, Christine, uh, I like them. I like your viewers to go to see the live new site, the uh, new medium yeah. for John Henry Weston to be able to who show who shows his um, new shows without any restriction. That's but, a yeah, man. get away from cancel culture. LifeSiteNews.com, I believe. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, that man is extraordinary. He's afraid of nothing except displeasing God. Um, I invite your viewers to remain loyal to him as well, like to you, very much like you. Uh, he's dedicating his life to spread the faith. Despite all the errors that comes from Rome, we have to pray for uh, the Pope, whom I totally disagree with in matters of, in a great many matters of the faith, but he's a pontiff. We have to pray for his conversion, like John Henry Weston is recommending, like you have in, as well. We must pray for all the cardinals who are in error, and the bishops, and the, and the religious who commit mistakes. One thing can never be changed, either by man or by angels. And that's the deposit of the faith, the dogma of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. That, no matter what any pope in the future will say, cannot and will not be changed. The church is us. So I know you wanted to ask me about uh, well, remedy. I mean, yeah, I'm going to ask you that in a second, but you just made me think, you know, people have said to me, uh, why Why would you have, I've been thinking of having Taylor Marshall on. Well, he said the Pope's not the Pope. And I also, Michael Voris has been on the show and he won't honor Medjugorje. And, and then I've also had, obviously everyone knows I love Christine Watkins because we have a show together. But then I have all these people who have a little bit, I've had, um, Len Hudson, who is Conchita Gonzalez's uh, mouthpiece here in America. And, you know, everyone saw the video where he disagreed with Daniel O'Connor and some of the words on the, the Third World War potential. And and my my perspective, and I said to this person is, I am a vessel. I'm going to give them all a voice. I don't have to agree with everyone, but I agree with much of what Taylor Marshall says. I agree with much of what of you know church militant i believe much of life side I believe, and so i am going to be the last person i consider myself a broadcaster in that sense going i'm just going to let people have a voice 
my show is the tool and then let you use the intellect that God gave you to decide what you do and don't want to accept. But you can't blame me or Xavier for not at least giving you information. I mean, we're putting that out there as best as we can as a son and a daughter of Christ. Yes, and I, that's one thing that I admire very much about you. You're one of the few, um, like John Henry West, and I know Taylor, we're friends. I appeared in his show uh, even recently. I know also Glenn Hudson. We are friends as well. I uh, send letters to Conchita through him in Spanish. I, uh, I <laughs> but he's I'm a jealous, terrific. You know all those languages, yeah. And he has his mission as well. Yes. Uh, Taylor, terrific chap, terrific family man. Uh, he does his work. He was kind enough to invite me to discuss uh, a great many things. John Henry Weston, exceptional. You, you are also uh, uh, more than <laughs> more than neither sort of American Joan of Arc. What I like very much about you, uh, Christine, is uh, you stay faithful to your conviction, regardless of the opinion that you that this could inspire in others. And this is to your honor. You're you a great get me lady. Canceled, right? Yes, you're a great lady, and uh, you fear nothing except also this pleasing God. That's the impression you've given me. And that's why I consider myself, without any theatrics, very fortunate to call myself uh, votre ami, your friend. Ah. And um, But enough and of our friendship. Enough of our <laughs> friendship. Let's go to something real important here, as you alluded to. Uh, before sure. we went on the air, I told you the. Oh, you know what, my viewers? We're going to talk about the medicines, but I wanted to talk about one more thing before we got there because it's probably a little shorter but i i do want to ask him about yeah be prepared let's have these medicines in the house because that was also in in this book revelations and but before i do because it is shorter i was so enthralled Xavier, with the chapter in world war ii when uh, the world war one world <laughs> war one thank you for correcting me where the germans were entering france and one after another repeated either on, on his deathbed or to someone and the information became known to some, that, that's what I'm gonna ask you about, how did you get this information? But that our blessed mother, as the Germans were infiltrating France, made an appearance, held her hand out and they turned back. Over a hundred thousand of them witnessed, and you can give the details in a minute, and witnessed this, they were terrified but then they were ordered by their commander or their general or someone said, say this to no one. So 100,000 people at one time saw her, but were sworn to silence. But they can never keep quiet, not all of them. So can you tell our viewers about what I'm talking about? Because I was like, wow, I believe it. Yes, that's a beautiful story. I heard it the very first time when I was a child from my mother whose father, my grandfather, um, participated in World War I from 1914 until uh, Armistice Day with the Germans in November of 1918. So the story goes as such. That was during the Battle of the Marne in 1916. The Germans had pierced against the Allied lines. Uh, the French and the English have been uh, not defeated, not by a long shot, but their lines of defense have been breached. And the Germans were going full speed ahead with a corps of army of infantry uh, towards Paris. They could see the Eiffel Tower from a, a few kilometers away. And you'll remember for those uh, history buffs that are viewers, it was a story where um, what they call the miracle of the taxis. You know? The French army requisitioned every single taxi in Paris to move as many men as possible on the newly defense line to reject the Germans and push them away. The fact of the matter is the victory of the Battle of the Marne was not due thanks to the extraordinary uh, French um, uh, speed, a military speed and uh, astuteness, but due to an extraordinary miracle give, granted by heaven through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Indeed, as the Germans were going full speed ahead of, of, in towards Spice, thinking that once they reached the French capital, uh, the Germans would seek uh, peace terms, the Germans were advancing on the French emerald green plains, and all of a sudden, they saw a massive, gigantic, half-transparent woman appear and do the, the sign of stop with her both hands. 
the Germans, some of them who didn't know uh, very much about Christian or Catholic history, thought he was, uh, at the time, uh, blessed Joan of Arc. I, Joan of Arc, I don't believe, was canonized until 1922, if memory serves. So the war, she was not canonized yet, she was blessed. So she thought, they thought, the Germans, that was Joan of Arc come to save France yet again. Some of them immediately turned their hills and ran eastward. Others immediately recognized the Blessed Virgin Mary and immediately dropped their, their, their guns and turned around. Immediately captured by the rear troops that were coming forward and some of them were arrested. Others were captured because uh, as they, they retreated, it gave enough time for the French to come back in mass, in strength, and push the Germans back. No. But normally, if you ask some historians, and I did, uh, there was no logical explanation for the Germans you know, to have halted their speedy advance towards Paris. And he, who knows, it might have changed completely the turn of events or the end result of World War I if Paris would have been captured. But we were that close from losing the French capital. And many Germans, soldiers were, as the French were coming back, since they, the Germans did not take advantage of their advance, the French were coming back in mass and in strength and captured many prisoners, some wounded, some not. And on a couple of occasions, I wrote about it indeed in my book, uh, some German soldiers who were about to die and who were taken care by French nuns mm -hmm. or French nurses said, look, um, I, will, I would be normally put on an um, execution post or against the wall if uh, my superiors knew that I was telling you this. But the reason why we were not able to march towards Paris is because we saw an huge, gigantic vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary who ordered us to stop. The great majority of us immediately turned hill and ran towards east. We were stopped by our superior officers who, uh, under the threat of death, uh, made us uh, take a vow never to repeat what we saw. No? But uh, since you've taken such great care of me, and my time is now counted, I wanted to share this with you. And unquestionably, this leads me to believe that the French will be victorious in doing this conflict with Germany. I do not think we will win like we did with the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, it's been instituted, you have the Blessed Virgin Mary on your side. We cannot win. Those were words spoken by German, not one, not two, not three, but a handful of prisoners who were taken and captured uh, and taken care of by French nuns and captured by French soldiers. This is in the annals of French history. And... Um, and they As were in the, separate places. They weren't all in the same hospital, so you can't say it originated from one place. These were coming various places and then the stories kind of got to each other exactly after that. yeah exactly and my grandfather did tell the same story to his sons and to his daughter my mother by the way a brief uh, another brief anecdote just to tell you I, I would like to share with you as as my friend and to with your viewers my grandfather was also catholic he was a corporal in the french army and his task was to go in no man's land to capture the to retrieve the wounded one day he was hit by the german sniper uh, with a bullet straight in the heart. Immediately he fell on his back, stood up again, felt a tremendous pain, opened his shirt, and that German bullet smashed against a large gold medal of the scapula my grandfather was wearing. He was buried with it. If it weren't for that miracle, he who is speaking to you right now in front of your camera would not, would be, here. not be here to tell you this story. So I'm doubly and my and his son a few years later in world war ii also was arrested by the gestapo close to the rue du bac the place where the version appeared to catherine saint catherine labour and to give the miraculous medal was arrested by a in a hotel l'hotel Quéret, which was two minutes from the miraculous chapel where the miraculous medal was given he escaped in broad delight killing two germans in the process allowing all the other prisoners that were betrayed by um, the French traitors. He has given broad delight. The Germans went after him. He managed. After the deepest prayer he ever wrote, he ever made in his life, he wrote this in his journal. I even published a book in France about the story. After the biggest and deepest prayer he ever wrote, 
He escaped in broad daylight, killing two Germans in the process, liberating his friends, and was able to return through Lysander operation in the French countryside, returning to London and continuing the war. Two miracles have blessed my family, thanks to the mm-hmm. Blessed Virgin Mary. And that was another reason why I felt obliged to die. Because say she so- needed you to live. She needed <laughs> you to be born so you could write and this. My children. Yes, and my yes. children. So that's why I'm so ever so grateful to heaven. Mm-hmm. And particularly to the mother our Lord has given us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're right. If we pay attention, because I thought about this, I have two daughters and, you know, my daughters will say stuff because they're not exactly active in the faith right now. Like, well, this, this, or this. And I'm like, how do you know? You don't know any of this. You're not, what, when's the last time you watched any Catholic media? When's the last time you read a Catholic book? When's the last time? And there's so many people that don't even know this history that's taking place because we don't read. I mean, we have to choose our media sources. Are we just going to watch ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN? Um, are we going to read books? And then we have to, I mean, we're going to be responsible for what we ingest or what we refuse to ingest. But there is so much that is happening that I think our mother is trying. I mean, she just like a typical mom, she's like, please, my son just loves you, but I cannot beg him any longer for to, to stay his hand. So these things that she's trying to get out are available for us so that we can be prepared, which leads me to the third thing I wanted to talk about, which you already alluded to, which was the medicines. Now, before I ask you about them, you have a whole chapter that's entitled, uh, I think I wrote it down here, uh, Upcoming for upcoming diseases and medicines. Oh, shoot. That's not the name of the chapter. Remedies against upcoming illness and diseases, starting on page 193. You have in here, which was given by our our Lord, the remedy against an unknown mortal burning disease, a prayer that will preserve against future plagues, chest and headache ailments, remedies for cholera, and so on. And there are, are remedies for mental troubles chest pains, violent headaches, but these were, and and I love the one for the unknown diseases. So, oh, and remedy to protect yourself from deadly plagues. I apologize for looking down, but it was such a rich chapter. And I believe our mother is saying, guys, wake up. We're giving you the medicine now. Have it in your house. Be ready so that not if, but when this happens, you can be protected. i beg of you. So I would love for you to just any part of that speak to these medicines. And then of course, we want to tell people how they can get their hands on it, which, you know, your, your great helpers been getting a little bit overwhelmed, but yeah. Can you speak to that? And and how were you, as you were reading this going, you know, we have nothing to fear. Exactly. Um, Yes. That was through the apparition of uh, given to Marie Julie Jani. Um, it's an, uh, an extraordinary apparition case. I think it's uh, chapter two in my book. Is the largest of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, it, ha- it, uh, it took place with a French lady, a stigmatist, uh, and uh, who passed away in 1941. So yes, one of the during all these so many years of apparitions and revelations given to Marie Julie Jani. Uh, heaven, uh, some re- remedies for the future events and diseases that were going to spread throughout the world. And this was this was given way before COVID nineteen. You now, uh, when I write, I wrote this book, COVID nineteen did not exist quite yet. So there will be, according to the prophecies that were given to my Jani, a disease considerably harsher and more severe. And COVID-19, which will be a picnic in comparison to what is about to happen. This disease is called is going to be called the burning disease. The symptoms will be these. You will start to feel on the skin tremendous burn. You will see some spots that will spread out, which will become black and in the center some sort of yellowish color. It will affect the mind. It will affect the tongue. Your blood pressure will rise considerably. And a certain stench will be produced from these wounds. Mm. Your skin will, will appear very reddish all around those particular wounds. And this virus will be airborne and terribly, terribly mm-hmm. contained. The Blessed Virgin May stated that there will be no remedy known by the human art of medicine. 
except one, granted by heaven. Now, I will tell you what it is now, but I ask you to forgive my poor English pronunciation, which is ghastly, but I hope you'll understand it. Please. Well, if you forgive how I say Marie, Julie, Jehenny. <laughs> <laughs> the, the remedy is this, and I'll tell you how to prepare it, because the version also gave specifics how to prepare it. It must be taken from the leaf of the hawthorn. Mm -hmm. hawthorn, hawthorn plant. Mm -hmm. Hawthorn plant. Hawthorn leaf. The version asked that the wooden part be eliminated, of course, and that you proceed by boiling a container of water, boil it for um, until it starts boiling. No? Once it's boiling, the version man did not stipulate the quantity or how many leaves. I would suspect that even one is enough. But to put hawthorn leaves in this boiling water pot and to cover it with a cover for 14 minutes, not 13, Okay. Not 15 minutes. The version May was extremely specific. 14 minutes. Do not ask me why. I would be incapable of telling you why. But those were the instructions of the Virgin Mary through Marie Julie Jeanne. Once the 14 minutes are up, immediately take off the cover, take the container of the fire, and then make a tea or keep the tea of this particular liquid with the whole thorn leaf and apply it and or consume it three times a day, preferably before or after making a particular prayer to heaven. Heaven, through the Blessed Virgin Mary, promised that those who would do so with faith were, or would simply consume or apply this particular tea would be saved from death, from this particular disease. Mm -hmm. No. But if it is taken too late, after the symptoms have taken too quickly the body of a victim, it will not save that person, but it will alleviate the suffering of this particular person, who, I'll remind you, will have mental problems, will have problems with the speech, will start to have high blood pressure to the point of excruciating pains, and will have um, wounds on the skin the way I just described a few moments ago. Yeah. That is the principle uh, and there are other remedies that have been offered as well. And this particular leaf also will protect people from cholera. So this is exactly how we were told we are supposed to uh, apply or use or consume this particular tea. Myself, and um, we used to work with other visionaries, uh, with Father Laurentin, who uh, received mes similar messages of the Blessed Virgin Mary from particular roses, which she blessed of kids during apparitions. And she asked also some tea of, out of the leaves of these roses to be made. We used to make, and there's been many miraculous healings, which Father Laurent and I recorded and sent to the local archbishops. You used vision. to make what? A tea. A certain oh, tea. With you rose made petals. it already. Yes, with rose okay. petals from the other apparition sites we used to wear with Father Laurent. So what we used to do with the tea, we used to boil it, not for 14 minutes, but for an unspecific amount of time. And there was the water became a tea, but with some impurities. We used to pass the tea with a coffee filter, so as right. to take away the impurities. And then we put a tea of rose petals in the refrigerator. It was actually delicious. And it did create mm -hmm. a great many healings and even conversions, incredibly enough. In this particular instance, it's not rose petals, it's the whole thorn leaf that the Virgin May requested for the healing of this uncurable disease that is yet to come that will be terribly contagious, airborne, and will cause multitudes, multitudes of victims throughout the entire planet. I hope that answers your question. It does. It does. And there are so many, as I read, you know, different diseases and illnesses that it's saying, here's what we need to to Here's what you can do to cure these things. Right. And so I already, because I had you on my show, had people emailing me, how can I get this in your book? You put how to get it. And a couple of people said, I, I reached out to the person who's in the book and I hadn't heard. And then, so I reached out to you and you said, you had no idea how, popular this would be or how many people would reach out so in the book it says to reach out to kathleen loney um who will supply can you talk about what kathleen is doing and that she's had to bring on extra people and what she has said to you and that yes keep going to her and you will get what you need just be patient can you speak to that yes kathleen mrs kathleen loney is a charming 
American lady who lives in Ohio. She only aspires one thing, to have as many fellow Catholics or Christians or faithful uh, be saved and being able to save their families with these particular remedies. She is selling at cost all those sacramentals, the medals, the uh, the purple yeah, scapula yeah. given by Our Lady to through Marie Julie Jani, which is supposed to protect the homes, the people and the families of uh, the bearers of these particular scapulas, the cross of pardon, and so on and so forth. She has come up with a, a particular kit which she sells at cost. And this book, as you mentioned, has gone uh, off the charts. Uh, I was never expecting this. I published books in France, in Italy, in Germany, uh, about Marian apparition sites. Nothing can even come close to this. And in France, I sold over 50,000 books on one particular one, the latest one. This one is beating all the records. I don't find any particular pride of this. The only thing that interests me is simply for these messages, which in some cases have been hidden purposely uh, from the faithful. It is important that we remedy this, that the faithful, the children of God, hear these messages and prepare themselves spiritually and physically. Yeah. So Mrs. Loney in Ohio, and I put her email address at the end of the book. Yep. I believe the page is it's at the very, very end. Very end. But you have your name. Yep, page 565. Email. There you go. Right there. Exactly. So there you have her name, her email address. You can contact her through that way. And in advance, she asked me to present her apologies to some people who have contacted her and haven't gotten her kit yet. She began all alone. Then when the scores of orders became hundreds of orders, then thousands of orders, she was being overwhelmed, the poor lady. When I told her that, look, there are complaints you have to contact, she, the poor lady began to cry. Aww. So I felt blooming terrible. And finally, she decided to hire um, a lady from her parish to help her cope with all the enormous volumes of orders. Again, this lady sells at cost. She makes no profit. She just wants to, and she has a tremendous devotion for Marie-Julie Jani. She wants to help Marie-Julie Jani by spreading those gifts that heaven has given through her. Mm -hmm. So now she's uh, recovering uh, speed she's going to hire possibly a second person because the others keep on coming and this poor lady has lost so many hours of sleep at night yeah she continues to do what she can but she asked me to present her apologies in advance if sometimes she takes a bit of time but she always sends the orders so voila uh -huh. I, that, I did that's my awesome choice. that's why i wanted to say that on the air because people are like i want to get my hands on it and to the best of your knowledge we can't find we don't know an organized place that sells the hawthorne leaf or some of the other things that we need i mean someone viewing may be able to say well here's hawthorne you can get it from this store or here's this you know leaf that comes from this place but miss loney has all in, in one place where she can send it all Ever. out correct yeah yes all the herbs all the plants all the sacramentals the metals the scapulars including even a, a, a rice paper on one instance, uh, the Virgin Mary said that for unknown diseases, and that's going to sound very difficult to accept to many of your viewers, it was for me. It took me a very long time to digest that information I'm about to give you. I thought there was too much Hollywood, too much Hollywood plot, very American. I thought, but no, it was not American, it came from France. So I lost a beautiful opportunity <laughs> to, to be quiet in this instance. But in one of the messages she received, the Virgin Mary said for those particular unknown diseases that will be devastating. If you don't have the Hawthorne, you can write on a piece of paper, O crux, Ave O crux, uh, which is a prayer in Latin, O hell to the cross, no? And uh, a lot of people had uh, difficulty with the idea of swallowing paper, maybe mm -hmm. with toxic ink. So uh, Mrs. Loney came with a brilliant concept, which was to write mini on minuscule letters, uh, with non-toxic ink on rice paper, which melts on the tongue. That particular prayer. Wow, wow. So to have that blessed by your priest, she sells those as well at cost. She has no earnings on for many of these sales. So there is the Medal of Good Guard, the Scapular Medal, the Purple Scapular, Cross of Pardon, all the herbs that we discussed. Uh, and also she sells the St. Benedict Medal as well at cost which is an exorcist medal, all, none of these, and also the blessed candles, 100% uh, 
these ones which are supposed to be helping for the three days of darkness it's all in the book and on my past videos so she sells an entire kit with everything that marie julie Jeunie has received and um again be indulgent contact her she will uh, she wants only to help she wants to propagate this i don't participate in one way or the other i just want to her to she she contacted me i think after she heard one of my shows and uh, she asked me how she could help and then she said this is what i would like to do can we do that i put her in contact with the granddaughter of the marquis de la franquerie who was the uh, biographer of marie julie Jeanne in france and this is how she started so again she sells everything at cost with a heart of gold and only with uh, the aspiration to help as many faithful as possible and i'm going to say because you and i didn't even mention this so this is unscripted is that I have learned in my profession, there are some people that I help their marriages, their spouses left them and they're devastated and they want help with standing and they can't afford to pay me because my husband's like, look, Christine, you've got to, you got to bring in some money. Right. Um, and, but I can't turn anyone away. So I charge people and those who can't afford to pay will, will pay me with a mass. And, um, you know, if they have $10 or 15 or 20, then I'll let them pay what they can. But I have other people who will donate to the site to cover the costs of those who can't. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for Kathleen. If you have been blessed by the Lord financially, but you don't know how to do some of the things that other people are doing, maybe ask for one kit and pray, pay for two or pay for three so that somebody else who cannot afford it, or maybe Kathleen would be able to hire another assistant to get these up. Because if you remember, she is having viewers from around the world, not just in America. We've got to think bigger. People from Europe and Asia and, and, and South America uh, and United States are all going to that one site. So I would lo I always love supporting people who are trying to support Christ. So yes, if you can send donations to her so that she can hire more people and get these out faster, pray on it. Ask the Holy Spirit if that's what he would have you do. I think it's it's probably pretty Pretty wise idea, I think, to do that. Um, Xavier, so much more. I'm going to be reading more of the book. I am on page, oh, I don't know, 287. And then, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know if I'm halfway through 500 and something to do my quick math. So I'm past halfway through. Yes, I am. But I'm going to have you on again when I read another section because I like, instead of just talking about the book as a whole, to talk about these little things that maybe other people like I hadn't heard about and want, want to hear the specifics. Um, I know some people too are like, I just hate reading. And so tell me what's inside the book. So I would love to keep talking about it as we go. And I know you've already agreed to come back on. So we'll do this again. By all means, I'd love to. No, oh, me too. So, okay. So you know how I end. Um, name one thing, just one thing that you would have our listeners do differently as a result of something we talked about today. I'm going to sound like an old record. I scratch one, but... I invite um, all of you, and even those who will criticize this or that, we have one thing that, keep, that makes all our hearts beat as one. That's our faith in God. And in the Blessed Virgin Mary, and in our church, even if we disagree on this or that, that makes our heart beat as one. I invite you all to follow the request of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which she asks so imploringly, Please go to confession, if you can, once a month. And do not receive communion unless you are in a state of grace. Receive communion as often as you can. Do believe that it is not a symbol. Do believe it is a true presence of our Lord, the body and blood, the soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Please, these are the keys to salvation. Pray for me, please, and for my family. Pray for John Henry Weston. Weston, for his family, for his crew that are crossing blades every day against their detractors. And please pray for Christine Bacon and her friends, uh, for her family, for she's also. And I do not throw flowers easily in anyone's direction. She's truly extraordinary, a lady consumed with kindness. And let us remain in union in prayer, union prière. And thank you to all of you. Merci. Yes, we we've, we stand again. We stand together against cancel culture. So you know we are Xavier, myself, and and a lot of those others 
that you know and you love watching. We're there trying to get as much of these messages out as we can before we're shut down because we know that's going to happen. If the church is going to go underground and appear as if it does not exist, as some of these apparitions have already said, um, certainly you won't see some of us. So as long as we can give you what we know while we know it, and you, you know, do the discernment yourself. Talk to the Holy Spirit and follow his lead because that's who you should be following. Xavier and I are here just to try to deliver information. Follow the Holy Spirit. Do what you can. So I'd love you to follow me, breakfastwithbacon.com. I am on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and what's Rumble. And so go ahead and like me anywhere. Xavier, if they want to get a hold of you, where can they do that? Um, you don't have a website yet, do you? I do not have one yet. Um, you can contact me through um, through me uh, if they need you. For you. Okay. Yes, absolutely. I totally uh, blindly trust you. Uh, through also uh, the live near site news uh, dot com, and uh, and also through I think the uh, heart refuge heart, uh, which I think they're going to interview me tonight as well, uh, live. So, but principally. Contact me through um, Christine. Uh, Christine will follow yeah. me any communications you wish. And I will work on a website very soon. Yeah, you should. Even if it's just a simple website saying how to contact you, here's your book, how to order it. Here's Kathleen Loney to do that. And I think we'd like that. <laughs> so now, now comes the fun part. Um, I know you know how to do this because now you're a pro, but I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You have been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life on the sunny side up, I believe. <laughs> yes. <laughs>